Well, good evening. It's time for our Bible study. And we are in Isaiah chapter 7 this week. And then I think next week we jump to like chapter 23. Like I said, there's 66 chapters in Isaiah. And we are going to jump quite a few of those chapters in one week. So um, this week we learn about God's sovereignty. So let's pray and we'll start. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for who you are. Lord, you are God above all. You are in control even when we feel like we're spinning out of control. And Father, I praise you for that. Lord, I just pray that you open our hearts and help this lesson to fall on our hearts that are ready to hear and ready to understand what you want us to learn from this lesson. I pray, Lord, that you will teach this lesson through me and that it would not be my words, but yours. And that, Father, just give us hearts to hear and to see and to understand. Lord, help us to realize and to apply it to what it means to us today. That it's not just a history lesson, but, Father, it's a life lesson for us. Lord, I pray for your forgiveness. I pray that you will be our guide and that we will have the courage and submit to you and allow you to be our guide. I pray all of these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Uh, like I said, we are in chapter 7 of uh, Isaiah tonight. I told you when this series began that Isaiah kind of scared me. There are just things in it I don't understand. I think there are things in it that no one understands. Um, so to set up tonight's lesson... Um, Ahaz is the king. Ahaz was the grandson of uh, King Uzziah. And so Ahaz was king from um, about 735 B.C. until about 720 B.C. Uh, so he ruled for about 15 years. He, uh, he became king very young at probably 20 or 25. His father was Jotham. And so we've, we've come down through that progression. Um, we know that the kingdoms have divided. There's the northern kingdom, which is called Israel and, and even called Ephraim. We'll see that they, they began to be called Ephraim, um, named after the tribe of Ephraim, or just kind of because that was 10 tribes in that northern kingdom. And so it just kind of became known as Ephraim. And then the southern tribe, which was, or the southern kingdom, which was Judah and Benjamin, just known as, as Judah or as the southern kingdom. And that is where Ahaz was king. Ahaz was king during troubled times. Uh, the northern kingdom had um, kind of an alliance with Syria because they were both on Assyria's checklist to be taken over. Assyria was the the power of that day. And so they had taken over areas around them and, and caused a lot of misery to the northern kingdom and to the southern kingdom already. And so the northern kingdom of Israel, or Ephraim as we will call it tonight, and uh, the their neighboring kingdom, a kingdom next to them, which was Aram or actually Syria, uh, they were literally next on the checklist for Assyria to take over. And so what they were trying to do, and especially Israel, was trying to put the pressure on Judah to join them, to join their forces, be their, be part of their alliance to stand against Assyria. And Ahaz really didn't want to. He did not want to, to make that alliance with that northern kingdom and with Syria. And so what he will end up doing is making an alliance with Assyria themselves. And so um, he he jeopardizes his country is what he really does. But anyway, he, he's scared to death. He, he's terrified because the northern kingdom and, and their neighboring kingdom of Syria are threatening to invade them, literally on their doorstep, threatening to invade them if they don't join their alliance. And so that sets us up for what... Um, where tonight's lesson, where today's lesson begins, because this is where Isaiah comes to Ahaz and says, here's what the Lord says about this. Here's what the Lord, here's the word from the Lord about this. And so we begin in verse uh, seven of chapter seven in Isaiah. And he says, 
He says, thus saith the Lord God, it shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. And within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it shall not be a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. If ye will not believe, surely ye will not be established. So here is Isaiah coming to Ahaz and saying, here is the word of the Lord about this matter. Here's what the Lord is telling you about this matter. He's, he's telling you, he, literally up in the verses just before this, Isaiah tells him to, to be calm and not to be fearful, just to trust in the Lord. And so he's, Isaiah says, the Lord has told me that this isn't going to happen that it won't happen, that it, it will not come to pass. He says, because the head of, of Damascus, which uh, the head of Syria, which is Damascus, their capital city, and the head of Damascus is resin. That's just a man. That's just a country and just a man. And then he goes on to say, and, and, um, and Ephraim, it, the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son, just a man. But think about who you are. You are Judah. You are Judah. You are the tribe that King David came from. You are sitting on the throne that was established by God. These are just men. And God is saying, this will not come to pass. Just have faith in me. This will not come to pass. Ahab, I'm sure Ahaz was terrified. He was terrified for himself. He was terrified for his people. And so he's got to consider this word from Isaiah. And, you know, it's hard even for the most faithful, for the, the strongest believers to take God for his word when things are tough, when things are really hard. It, it's, it's, it's hard. But God says it isn't going to happen here. It is not going to happen. These are only men and they're weak. God is behind the throne that you're on. And so, and like I said, it refers to that northern kingdom here as Ephraim. And he says, in three score and five years, that's 65 years. Within 65 years, you won't even realize that these were ever a people. These, these countries that seem so strong and are such a threat to you now, that are on your doorstep saying they're going to invade you if you don't join alliance with them, these very nations will not even be a people in three score and five years, and that would be 65 years. That's a long time. I mean, here is Ahaz, you know, and he's on his throne, and, and he's saying, well, 65 years from now is a long time. That's a long time. They could defeat me in that amount of time, but God said, no, it's not going to happen. Um, as a matter of fact, um, the northern kingdom did fall. They fell uh, in like 722, which was just probably a couple of years from this time. Uh, no, I think that was Syria that fell by then. I think, uh, I think the northern kingdom hung on a little bit longer, but they did fall within Ahaz, within, within his reign. They did fall. And literally, the Assyrians took them all away except for just a few stragglers that they left behind. And they, they planted people from other areas that they had conquered in that land. And so those few uh, Jews that had, had left there, as, that were left there as stragglers, intermarried with these people from other nations that the Assyrians brought in there and planted in there. And they intermarried, and the, those, that offspring really became a group of people that we know as the Samaritans. And, you know, when, uh, like in Jesus' time, after, after they came back from being captive in Babylon, and, and they came back and they re-inhabited their land, if you remember, the Jews and the Samaritans were very much a separate people. The Jews looked down on them because they had, they had intermingled in, and, um, they were not, um, you know, they were not, oh, sorry, um, they were not pure Jews. And so they, they very much uh, didn't 
uh, respect them and we're not respected. Um, my battery on my phone is about to die, so I hope it does not. I hope it holds out. I have it plugged in, so I apologize if we lose contact here. Um, so anyway, we go now to verse 10 and 11, and it says, Moreover, the Lord spake again to, unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. God is literally saying, just ask me for a sign. Don't, don't do anything on your own accord. Ask me for a sign. Let me prove to you. Let me prove to you that I will uphold my promise to you. Just have faith in me and let me prove to you. And, and he isn't just saying, you know, any sign. He says, you can ask me anything. Anything, he says, uh, ask either in the depth or in the height above. Ask me anything as high as the heavens or as low as the hells. I don't care. I will give you whatever sign you ask. God wants Ahaz to trust him. God wants this throne of David to continue. He is, he's encouraging Ahaz, just ask me for anything and I'll show you so that you'll believe me. God knows our tendency. He knows we have a tendency to be weak. He knows we have the tendency to try to solve things on our own. He knows that about us. And so he's encouraging Ahaz. He says, just ask me for a sign and I'll give you the sign you ask for so that you can trust me and that you can believe in me and have faith in me and not enter into alliance with these other countries. And then in verses 12 and 13, but Ahaz says, I will not ask. I will not tempt the Lord. And he said, and this is Isaiah speaking here, and he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but ye will, but will ye weary my God also? So Ahaz is kind of giving that pious answer of like, I will not ask God for that. I won't tempt God. I won't put God to the test. I'm not going to do that. So that sounded like this real pious answer. You know, like sometimes when we do, when we say, um, well, I think we'd better pray about that. Or um, we, we'd better really pray about that before we make a decision. When really and truly, we don't know. We haven't contacted God. We haven't, we haven't ourselves prayed about it. And maybe that's just a way that we can delay what our decision is or not make a decision. And so Ahaz is saying, oh, I won't tempt God, trying to be very pious here. But, a but Isaiah doesn't fall for it. He calls him out. He calls him out on it. And he says, uh, and hear me. He's basically saying, you listen to me, young man. I think that is exactly, if he were in today's time, I think he would get up in the face of this young king and say, you listen to me, young man. You may try my patience but you're trying the patience of God now. And you had better watch out because this is not a good move for you to make. So he says, Hear ye now, O house of David. Hear ye now, O house of David. He is saying, Ahaz, you are the king of Judah. You are sitting on the throne that God established through David. Do you not think that this same God that established that throne is not strong enough to carry you through what you're going through right now? You are trying my patience. He says, is it a small thing for you to weary men? In other words, you're trying my patience, me, this man. But, ye, but will you try the patience of God? Will you weary God also? Not a smooth move. So Isaiah, basically, he says, I call it as I see it, Ahaz, and here's what I see. Here's what I see. I think, I think he's telling us to beware, to not cover things, not cover decisions, not cover things that need to be done, not cover not following faith in God with some kind of pious or righteous-sounding saying. We have got to be strong in God. And that's hard to do sometimes, especially when we just really don't understand what's going on. Um, 
So in verse 14, this is, this is basically saying, okay, you won't ask for a sign? I'll give you a sign anyway, whether you want it or not. In verse 14, it says, therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, teaching this lesson, I was good up to here, pretty good up to this point. And then I told you I was scared to death of Isaiah. I'm not really sure what all the implications of this verse are. Because this is a sign to Ahaz. Ahaz will be king for another 15 years or so. And it's 700 years, over 700 years, before Jesus will be born. We understand. I mean, Matthew refers back to this verse in Isaiah about the virgin that will conceive and call and have a son and call his name Emmanuel. But many Bible scholars think that there was an immediate application of this verse. That the word Alma that's used for virgin does not always have to be literally the term virgin. That it can mean young woman, it can mean young married woman. Uh, some Bible scholars think that this the immediate interpretation of this was actually a son that was to be born to Isaiah, that um, possibly his first wife had died um, and that he was taking on a new wife, a young wife, and that this could be that son. But who knows? I don't know. I, Bible scholars don't know. We do know that Matthew refers to this verse for the birth of Jesus. And we love this verse, and we treasure this verse for that. But was there an immediate sign for Ahaz? Or was it just a sign for the descendants of Ahaz, you know, that would to come, including us, you know, in our day and time? I don't know. Not going to argue it, not going to pretend to know exactly what all of that in, in interpretation would be. But I do believe in what Matthew uh, referred to it as, is the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, who would become the Savior literally of the world. God was trying to save Ahaz. He was trying to save Ahaz in his kingdom. And Ahaz, in his lack of faith, didn't take that sign. And he didn't follow God in faith. He actually did. He actually signed, he entered into an agreement. Instead of entering into an agreement with the northern kingdom and with Syria, he entered into an agreement with Assyria, who was the biggest bully on the block. And I loved the analogy, if I can find it, um, the analogy that um, that the the lesson used was Ahaz basically invited a jaguar into his house to protect him against the wild dogs that were outside, which that analogy pretty well sums it up. Not a wise move under any circumstances. Um, and then we go to verse 15, and it says, Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. This is another one of those verses. It's referring to the time frame. It's still talking about that child of the prophecy. Um, and it's, it's talking about the, the time frame. And some of the things I read didn't even totally agree on that time frame. Um, the point is that it was going to happen, that this prophecy was going to happen. Um, the sign was there. The sign was going to be there. The prophecy was going to happen. That if if you read back, if we go back to that that verse that said, um, if in verse nine it says, if you will not believe, talking to Ahaz, if you will not believe, then surely ye shall not be established. I don't think I discussed that back in that verse. But basically, that's where God was saying, these other kingdoms, it isn't going to happen. They're not going to take you over. Not if you'll just have faith and trust in me. But if you don't, you won't be established either. Your establishment will fall. You will fall. You will have the same faith that they do, and you will fall. And of course, we know that they did. And so this verse in verse 15 is basically just saying there's a timeline to this. 
still talking about that child of prophecy, while he's eating butter and honey, and when when he's he's just he's old enough to just know evil from good. When he's old enough to make make choices, this is the timeline that this will take place. And then we move to verse sixteen and seventeen. It says, "For behold." The child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good. And the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. God's judgment, it is prophesied. It is to come at the hands of Assyria. The Lord shall bring upon thee and upon thy people and upon thy father's house days that have not come from the day that Ephraim departed from Judah and even the king of Assyria. And so... Before this child is old enough to, to refuse uh, evil and to choose the good. Now, some parts said age two to four. Other places that I read said that age of accountability, that age of 11, 12, 13, somewhere along in there. Either, either timeline works with when it actually happened. And so he's saying before this child is old enough to determine good from evil and make that choice. The land that, that you abhor, the land that you're afraid of, the land that you hate, that is sitting on your doorstep, these nations on your doorstep to destroy you, will face God's judgment. And they'll be forsaken. Their kings and their lands are going to face God's judgment, and they're going to be forsaken at the hands of Assyria. Assyria is going to take them over. And then the Lord shall bring upon thee. Now, this is Isaiah saying, this is what the Lord's going to do to you. You enter into this agreement, and this is what the Lord will do to you and to your people. The Lord shall bring upon thee and upon thy people and upon thy father's house, upon you, Ahaz, upon the people that you rule over, and upon your descendants to the throne. This is what God is going to do. Days that have not come, days that you haven't seen from the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, from the time, what, I don't know, 200 years ago, whatever it is, from Solomon or King David all the way down to now, your country has not seen days like this that are going to happen. From the, I mean, they hadn't been in captivity since the time of Egypt. And so, you're, you're going to see things that, that you just haven't, that your country hasn't seen since way times past because of your lack of faith in God and even at the hands of Assyria. And basically what, what Ahaz did is he entered into an agreement with Assyria and they had to pay these huge tributes. And one of the things I read even said that they, they brought in the false gods of, of Assyria into the temple. And they had to share the temple with those false gods. And they had to pay these huge tributes to the bully. These huge tributes. I'm sure Assyria was more than glad to enter into this agreement because they were going to have control over them just because of, you know, they were afraid of them. And they were going to get these huge monetary tributes that weakened the country. And so that's what Ahaz did. Instead of trusting in God, he entered into this agreement with Assyria. You know, sometimes it's hard. It's hard to trust God when when we don't when it when it's not clear. And most of the time things aren't clear. I mean, think about now in our time. Things are not clear. It's hard to know what is right. We have to be on our knees. We have to be praying. We have to pray that God will reveal what his will is and then give us the courage to abide by that will. Knowing his will is one thing. I think Ahaz fully knew his will. Isaiah told him, the Lord told Ahaz, I'll give you a sign. Ahaz knew the Lord's will. He was just afraid to follow it. He didn't have the faith that it would take to follow it. So do we see God's will, but we don't have the faith to follow it? We don't have the courage and the faith to follow it? I don't know. We want to take the wheel 
And that's not the way to live life, not successfully. God's got to have the wheel. We've got to let God have the wheel. We've got to let him have control. He is in control. He is sovereign God. His promises are real, and they will come true. And sometimes those promises involve discipline. Because when we are determined to live in disobedience, he promises us discipline. He promises to deliver us from that discipline. But it's down the road. It's after the discipline. And so submitting to his will and having the faith to follow that will, aside from just accepting him in salvation, is the most important thing that we can do in our lives. We have to pray that God will show us his will and give us the faith and the grace to follow that will. To stand up and to say, I'm going to trust you, God. I'm afraid. I admit that I'm afraid. But I'm going to trust you, God. Because I believe in your promises. So heal our fear. Overcome our fear. Help us to have enough faith to act on what you tell us we're supposed to do. And let that be our daily prayer. Literally our daily prayer. Because his promises do come true. And his promises do include disciplining us when we refuse to live according to his will. When we constantly live in disobedience, that promise of discipline is there. So pray for courage. Pray for faith and the courage to follow that faith.